Hello, I'm Swati Shanmugasundaram coming to you from Wurundjeri country and the lands of the Kulin Nation. Living through the pandemic and one of the world's longest lockdowns, Melbourne's teenagers have endured a lot. So, when the ABC called out to Melbourne's young people, asking them to share a true story about their life, we received an incredible response. Coming up is a collection of candid and courageous stories from our Takeover Melbourne competition winners, starting in North Melbourne, where Essay escapes the pressures of life through his love for music. Living through COVID has been crazy. I live in the North Melbourne housing estate. And last year, we were all forced into a hard lockdown. It all happened so fast. I remember seeing the police surrounding the building. It was pretty scary. One of the things that helped me get through it was music. Music takes me to a safe place where I can be myself and escape from the pressures of life. I started taking guitar lessons at school when I was 11. At first, I struggled to keep up. But now, I'm not too bad. I'd watch online tutorials and practice every day. After a while, I realized I could replicate anything I heard. I learned I had perfect pitch. For example, that knock was in E. Alright, mum. My mum was really supportive of my music. She moved to Australia from Ethiopia and sacrificed a lot to provide a better life for my sister and I. I am the first in my family to play instruments and music has become a new journey for us all. Being the first can be lonely. Sometimes I feel like I don't have anyone to turn to for inspiration because when I look at Australian musicians, they don't represent people like me. But having my family in my corner means I can pursue my passion for music. I hope to one day be successful in music and pave the way for kids like me who love music in Australia. Since I was eight, I've been teaching myself to sing the world's national anthems in their original languages. You might think it's a strange hobby, but I love how each anthem gives you a window into the culture, people and history of a country. I've learnt 38 anthems so far, with the aim to learn them all. What I love about our national anthem is how it talks about the geographical beauty of the country, being open to people who come to seek a better life and progressing the nation as one. The way I teach myself an anthem in a foreign language is by mimicking YouTube clips and watching pronunciation videos over and over. Once I learn the lyrics, then I dive into the research, working out what everything means, connecting with their culture. I stumble on lots of interesting, weird things, which I collect as fun facts, and then I usually run out to tell mum and dad. Did you know that the Dutch anthem is written in first person and pledges loyalty to the King of Spain? Whilst the Spanish anthem has no lyrics as they couldn't get a consensus on the words and the Japanese anthem is the shortest to sing with only 15 words? What? <laughs> no, where you get all these facts from? <laughs> One day, I want to visit all these countries. I look forward to continuing this journey of learning every national anthem only about 150 more to go. I think it's important we learn more about the world around us, and anthems are a great way to do this. Much cooler than just Monday school assemblies.
over a thousand years ago, my Samoan ancestors would come back from war and recreate battles for the village. They would spin, throw, and catch their Nifo Oti war clubs. Time passed, fire was added to the blades. And it became Sivafi, the fire knife dance. I was born in Melbourne, but lived on the beautiful islands of Samoa when I was younger. I loved it there, going to the beach, spending time with family, and eating delicious Samoan food. But when we moved back to Melbourne, I found it really hard to adjust. I began losing my Samoan language, eating junk food, and just gaming way too much. I felt disconnected like something was missing and I didn't know who I was. To help, mum took me to Samoan school and I signed up for Siva Afi. That workshop changed my life. I started training daily in the backyard. I saved up my pocket money and with mum's blessing bought myself some proper fire knife sticks. So this is Tani for Oti. Um, in English, nifo means tooth and oti means death, the teeth of death. I not only perform at events and celebrations, but teach students around the world with my online workshops. Today, I'm teaching students from Hawaii. I want this knowledge to be available to all Samoans and anyone wanting to build their confidence, discipline, and feel a connection to the Samoan culture. Sivafi has enabled me to be confident in my identity as a Samoan Australian. I no longer wonder who I am, and I hope I can help people be proud of who they are. I'm in year 12, and today is the last day of my exams. Can't wait to get all of this weight off my shoulders. I'm up early, as usual, 5 a.m. Studying as hard as I can. Education means so much to me. Due to the COVID lockdowns, my school has been right here, in my bedroom. Time to go. Okay. But I've been so focused that everything outside seems like a wall away. Good luck with this year. Thank you. Last test, Thank you very much. my brave son. Thank See you. you later, Dad. Perfect. See you later. Seven years ago, we left our country to seek safety. We heard that in Australia, everyone is accepted equally. It sounded like a utopia. The journey wasn't easy. A plane trip, a rough ride under a plastic sheet in the back of a truck. We spent three days on the wild ocean in a small rickety boat. Seeing the Navy with the Australian flag, bright blue, Waving in the air, people were crying and yelling, we are saved. We were taken to a detention center, and later, I would learn English. Refugees, you know, we have a different path to becoming Australian, but that does not define who we are. I've been here for more than seven years now. A highlight was a recent trip to Canberra. A photo of me was in the National Portrait Gallery. On the note it says, my goal in life is to become the future Prime Minister of Australia. To achieve this dream, I want to study law and politics so I could actually make a difference in the world. For asylum seekers, universities are so expensive because we are counted as international students. For me, the only way to go to university is to get a scholarship and that's why I'm studying so hard. Hello, my man. Congratulations, congratulations. I hope so it's the best to finish in the right way and finish here to end. It was very hard, but the stretch is all gone now. It's good, yeah. I don't want to be judged by my past, my religion, or the color of my skin. I just want to be seen as a 17-year-old with high hopes.
Growing up, I didn't want to be seen as the gay kid or the trans kid. I was already different, being the Persian kid. I saw how queer and trans people feared violence and experienced microaggressions almost every day. I didn't feel safe. So I hid my queerness. I watched what I wore, I muted my personality, and didn't engage with the queer community. But one morning, my life changed drastically. I woke up partially paralyzed from the waist down. A rare neurological disorder meant I had to use a wheelchair to get around. I could no longer merge into the background and conform. I was very visibly disabled. People looked at me with pity, with judgment, even curiosity. I felt like a zoo animal on display. Nobody wants to hurt someone in a wheelchair, but they did when I walked as a queer person. I started to understand my privilege. I learned how being visibly disabled protects me from some things, but also makes me vulnerable to neglect and injustice in almost every other aspect of life. I'm grateful for my wheelchair. It forced me to be visible. Hi everyone. Hello. Unable to hide anymore, and with the support of teachers and friends, I found a community who made me feel safe and accepted. Today is the first time I'm attending my LGBTQIA plus youth social group since the lockdowns ended. So EA is something good um, that's happened in the past week. They helped me grow into myself and into this body, allowing me to embrace my queerness and express my unfiltered personality. I've become visibly me. And that was a powerful story by Mac from Frankston. I hope you're enjoying the stories of Melbourne's teenagers which were created as part of Takeover Melbourne. To see more, head to abc.net.au forward slash takeover. Coming up next is 13-year-old Taekwondo sensation, Savannah. Taekwondo has not only taught me self-defense, but also resilience and determination, qualities that have helped me during these uncertain times. I started Taekwondo training when I was nine, and there was no doubt in my mind I wanted to earn my black belt. Gradually, I went from rank to rank, moving up through the belts until I was ready. The time had come for my black belt grading, and then COVID hit. The world dived into lockdown, and just like that, the grading was postponed. It felt like the world had paused. Outside activities like netball and cross country were cancelled. School and Taekwondo went online. Remote learning was a struggle, but I would give myself goals like, if you don't finish your assignment, there's no Taekwondo tonight. We turned a room into a training space and dad, who had no experience in martial arts, became my training partner. Grading was finally back on, but a little different. Everyone was ready. My instructors, the Grandmaster, and even my family in Queensland were looking on. This is it. This is what it was all leading up to. I kicked, punched, chopped, and flew through the air. Nothing could stop me. Not even COVID. The pressure was intense, but I ignored it. Then... Savannah, congratulations. You've just become the first person from our club to grade online to black belt, and I could not be prouder. I did it. I became an 11-year-old black belt. I was overwhelmed with emotion. The world had thrown so many obstacles in my way. 
the Taekwondo training had given me the resilience and perseverance to get through. So, look out world, here I come. My dad loves to fish. He always has. He fished as a boy back in Vietnam. He taught me how to fish. We would go early in the morning, on the pier, by the beach, a lake, or down by the river. It didn't really matter where. Whenever Dad got a fish on the line, he'd always pass me the rod. I never understood why. I thought that was the whole fun of fishing in the first place. Despite the mornings being cold, I always felt warm by his side. Things changed as I got older. I didn't really enjoy fishing as much. Putting a worm on a hook made me squirm, and waiting around all day was getting kind of boring. Most of the time, I just wanted to go home. But home wasn't the same anymore. Mum and Dad separated, and Dad moved out. It's been about five years since we last went fishing. But in some way, fishing still connects us. Dad visits all the time. Sometimes he brings his latest catch and we have it for dinner. Just because he doesn't live here, doesn't mean we're not family. How was school, eh? Yeah, it's alright. This week I had my IT exam, which was... Oh. It was alright, it was okay. But then, like... Looking back, I can understand why he always handed me the rod. Seeing me happy, made him happy. I used to think it was the fishing that kept us close. But... Over time, I've come to realise it doesn't matter what we do, just as long as we're together. As a young person growing up in state care, all I've ever wanted is to be heard. I'm a proud Aboriginal woman, but being Aboriginal adds its own complexities. For a long time, I thought I'd end up dead or on drugs because you often become what you're told you are. But I've defied those expectations. I know that there are other kids out there going through what I went through. That's why I'm hoping to become a Koori Engagement Support Officer and help other Indigenous young people achieve their potential. When I was 12, I came from Congo to Australia, ready to embrace its widely celebrated multiculturalism. But I didn't feel embraced back. I was confronted by the media calling young African people thugs and criminals. I was teased at school because of the way I looked. I internalized this racism and believed I wasn't good enough. Then one day, I saw my own shame reflected back to me. A little girl in the local youth group was upset about her natural curly hair. I told her it looked beautiful, and she said she'll never go to school like that. She'll get teased and bullied. I realized enough was enough. At school, I started a group called Afro Fever that empowered young people through art and dance and helped us showcase our roots to other people. Doing all that set me out on a journey to share my story. Last year, I gave a speech to an audience of 200 people. Everybody has Afro fever in them. You are Afro fever, we are all Afro fever. My good friend Georgette took my words and turned it into a dance. It was an amazing night.
I've now started hairdressing, another way of expressing myself and my roots. And I love seeing my African sisters be happy about who they are and what they have. I am both hopeful and scared for the future. I see more diversity in the community, but also more racism in the world at large. I want a world built on understanding and acceptance, and we need to strive to make that happen. My family are really sporty. I swim with my sister each week. My dad plays football. My mum plays netball. And they all love to ride bikes. But having a disability really got in the way. I'm deaf and I was born with cerebral palsy. And I can't ride a bike as my balance isn't the best. So I ride in the sea on the back of mum's bike. But last year, things got a whole lot better. It all started with a knock on the door. And you'll never guess who was there. All time Aussie tennis legend, Dylan Olga. Dylan had a present for me, a special tricycle. I couldn't believe it. It was incredible. I hopped on and rode up and down the road with Dylan. That was probably one of the best days of my life. This strike means everything to me. Being able to ride by myself, ride to school independently, and ride with my family is totally awesome. I love my family. They push me to give everything I go. If you were a kid with a disability, you should be able to do whatever you want to do. Now, I lead the family backwards. My family and I love playing games together. It can get a bit competitive sometimes, especially between me and my brother. I am a Muslim girl. Growing up, religion was never imposed. It was a way of life. When I was younger, I remember playing around with my mom's colorful and patterned scarves. That's when it dawned on me that there would come a time when I would start wearing one too. But I was embarrassed to wear it in front of my school friends, so I kept putting it off. The fear of not being accepted had swallowed me whole, leaving me afraid. On the first day of year seven, I decided it was time. Mum wrapped the hijab around me. The warmth of her hands around my face calmed me. As we drove to school, I was both excited and nervous. How would my classmates react? Would they behave differently towards me? I was about to be the only girl in the school wearing a hijab. I took some deep breaths and entered the class. The room was silent. Time passed, and no one said anything. I was shocked. After class, I hung out with my friends. We talked, caught up, and made jokes. Wearing the hijab hadn't changed a thing. I've been wearing it everywhere. I feel so bare without it, like it's part of me. Overcoming my anxiety, and embracing change made me realize I can be more open about who I am. This is a true me. Do you remember when you were three? I do. And I specifically remember playing in the backyard right here. Mum was hanging clothes and I was playing with the rocks on the ground, as you do. 
when a particular odd shaped frock caught my eye. It was shaped exactly like the number one. I remember thinking about how and why it was formed. What I didn't know then was that rocks, crystals, fossils, gems and minerals would become my absolute obsession. Ten years later and my precious rock collection spans my entire house. One, two, three, go, go, go! and it's still growing. Most of the collection I found on my own and on gold detecting and fossicking trips with my dad. Today, we're on the hunt for gold and one of my favourite crystals, the smoky quartz. We've heard rumours of its existence at this secret spot. In the past, we've travelled all the way to far north Queensland to find them, so I'm beyond excited to think we might find one so close to home. Oh, hang on, hang on. It's complete, Dad. Yep, that's a nice one. I feel so alive when I'm out in the bush, surrounded by millions of rocks. To think that these rocks were here at the beginning of time and I could be the first person to touch it amazes me. Since finding that first rock when I was three, I have just known I've wanted to be a geologist. I want to be surrounded by people who share the same passion as me. And I can't wait to see my rock collection grow even bigger. Although by then, we might need a bigger house. I love the training, I love the dedication that's needed to be a competitive gymnast. So I'm just going to do those couple of backflips for you, Wendy. My dream is to one day represent Australia. Looking good. It's a really nice tuck. Because of COVID, recently my lessons have been online. Gymnastics really allows me to zone out and forget about all that we've been through. Eleven years ago, we lost everything in the Black Saturday bushfires. I was only four and I remember my dad coming in the door and yelling, get out now. The fires were heading straight for us. We frantically jumped in the car and raced right through the inferno. We barely made it out alive. Some of our neighbours weren't so lucky. When we returned a few days later, our home, the place I was born, was completely destroyed. These trees remind me of that terrible day, but they also remind me how we can heal and regrow. We eventually moved back. We built a shed and that's become our home. For many years, everything was about rebuilding so we couldn't afford gymnastics lessons. But that only made me more determined and grateful when we could. Tonight will be the first time back in the gymnastics club after months Hi. of lockdown. I'm so happy, so excited. <laughs> Over a decade has passed since the fires. Rebuilding has been slow and tough. But ultimately, each challenge has only made me stronger. That's it for these Takeover Melbourne stories. To check out all of them, head to abc.net.au forward slash takeover. I'm Swati Shanmugasundaram. See you again soon.